Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this week. My name is Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. Uh, as usual, we are honored that you are taking the time to join us today. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time, but as always, we like to take a few minutes at the beginning to just remind you of how you can communicate and interact with us during our time together today. Uh, on your control bar, which is at the bottom of your web browser window, you will find both your chat icon and your Q&A icon. Now, I know by now in this Zoom world we are living in, you know exactly what these two little buttons are for, but I always want to issue this gentle reminder when you are entering something into the chat, please select all panelists and attendees before you hit send. Uh, so that way everybody who is online with us today can see what you have to say. If you don't do that, only a handful of us will get to see it. Uh, and that's just not as much fun that way. So please select all panelists and attendees uh, when you are using the chat today. And of course, try, if you can remember, to reserve your questions for the Q&A area. That allows us to get to them a little bit more efficiently. If you do by chance put your question in the chat area, no big deal, we'll get to it. Uh, but just wanted to remind you that uh, the Q&A is um, a faster way to get your questions answered. And we'll, we do the best that we can to answer questions throughout the session today. But if we don't get to it, we will answer at the end or we will follow up with you via email after our time together today. While we are waiting for the clock to strike three, go ahead to Twitter and follow us. And by us, I mean Saddleback and our speaker today, Orly Klappholtz of Multilinguals Forward. Uh, we are both very active on Twitter. So we would love it if you would uh, join us and uh, start and continue this conversation on integrating reading foundations for secondary SIF. It's a very important topic. We're so excited that she's here to talk to us about it today. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we're going to start. So let's bring in Orly and see how she's doing. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. It's a webinar day, so I'm always happy to, uh, yeah. to <laughs> look, we have um, our numbers are, people are signing in now. So um, let's go to the chat area here. If you are signing in, if you could tell us where you're joining us from, that's always nice to see where people are, uh, are joining from. We typically get all over the United States and sometimes we get a few, uh, a few of our friends from Canada who are able to jump in depending on how your school schedule is. We've got Kansas, North Carolina, New Jersey. We've got a few, oh, lots of North Carolina joining us today. Oh, Toronto's in the house, I knew it. <laughs> Southern California, Pennsylvania. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Oh, we've got Luxembourg, nice, okay. Yes, I, I always have a little um, uh, question, like are we going to get anybody from overseas and uh, how many of our Canadian friends are joining us today? So um, we are honored that you're here. We know that a lot of you are uh, our teachers and our webinars are still for most of you in the midst of a work day. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, able to join us live, it is, it is true. We truly appreciate it. I want you to know that. Um, I, so many of you are going to be watching the recording later. We appreciate you too. We're not leaving anybody out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we know how hard it is with your schedule sometimes to be able to jump in on these live. So um, we, we, it's always more fun with the level of interaction we get in the in the chat. So we'll get started in about two more minutes. Um, if uh, you could tell us in the chat, are you uh, what are you what grade levels are you teaching? Best webinars are from Saddleback. Thank you, Wendy. That's so nice. Thank you. Okay, we got some middle school, some high school. Okay. Ooh. Looks like we got the right audience for you today, Orly. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We got K eight. Okay. We've got some uh, lower elementary. That's fine too. Welcome. There's always something to learn. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, everybody. So we've got we've got the um, uh, the secondary, mostly a secondary audience with us uh, today. So so that's good. And Orly, where are you joining us from today? I am here from Broward County, South Florida. All right. So we've got Florida. Uh, most of our attendees know that I'm uh, in Central Texas. So uh, we've got Florida, we've got Texas, and we've got looks like uh, some West Coast uh, attendees as well. I saw uh, Southern California listed on our uh, chat area. Okay. 
a couple of EL specialists we got going here. Virginia, hi, Norma. <laughs> okay, Maine. This is great. Thank you all so much for being here. And I know many of you have questions because this is especially challenging. This, um, when we have older learners who have gaps in their education and we, we need to have, we need to, we need to cover uh, grade level content area sorts of um, topics, but we have to also lay that foundation too. It's, it's, it's complicated. So we need, we need help. And uh, that's why Orly is here to share with us uh, a little bit of her experience and what has worked for her. And um, we just thank you in advance, Orly, for, for doing this. Thank you for um, having me. I'm really excited. This is going to be great. And I think you all are really going to enjoy the, the handouts as well. The, the handouts, by the way, are linked in the chat as they always are. We will be putting that link in the chat periodically. So if you don't see it, try to uh, scroll back and see if it's in there somewhere. And if not, we'll go ahead and we'll drop it in there again um, periodically or uh, at your request as well. So let's go ahead and formally get started. As you all know, our topic today is integrating reading and writing foundations in the ELA content classroom. We're here to support secondary SIFE. And this is something that many of our attendees have been asking for, uh, always asking for more uh, ideas for supporting those students with uh, interrupted formal education. So uh, we hear you, we've answered the call. Uh, Orly is here to share with you. And if you don't know who she is, let me go ahead and formally introduce her to you. So with us today, we have Orly Klappholtz. She founded Multilinguals Forward in 2019 to bridge the vast gaps in educational research and action for multilingual students. Orly has experience creating specialized curriculum pairing grade level content with foundational skills and facilitating professional development and best practices for SLIFE. She worked as a classroom teacher and special education coordinator working with SLIFE and newcomers. And she's here today to talk to you about um, your burning questions around integrating those um, reading and writing foundations. So uh, Orly, I'm going to step to the side, let you take it from here. I will be monitoring the chat and uh, if it's okay with you, I will break in periodically if, uh, if needed, if there's any sort of burning question in the chat that, uh, that uh, we need to ask you. Absolutely, thank you, Liz, and thank right. you, Saddleback. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Saddleback, for inviting me to speak with you all today about integrating reading and writing foundations in the ELA content classroom. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about this. This uh, has been something that I've been doing in my classroom for a while uh, before I founded Multilinguals Forward. And as secondary teachers, like Liz mentioned, we really have an extra challenge of having the or integrating those reading foundations sometimes that's because of time time just doesn't allow it in the ela uh, curriculum the curriculum doesn't really allow it and oftentimes as secondary teachers we don't necessarily have the background in it because we don't expect to have to teach it or to teach it in general so we're going to first talk about what reading foundations are and then we're going to walk through um uh, how to actually do that within your curriculum. Before we do that, I want to talk about who SIFE are, who SLIFE are. I'm going to use the term SLIFE now um, with uh, to for students with limited or interrupted formal education. Um, most states do not disaggregate data when it comes to our SLIFE, so it's hard to know exactly how many uh, SLIFE we're talking about, what numbers look like in our states. Um, and we most of our states also have different uh, definitions of SLIFE. I chose this one specifically, um, which is the definition by DeCapua and Marsha, and uh, Marshall, sorry, uh, because it's the broadest. Uh, so it really includes all different types of SLIFE definitions, um, right? So they're generally English learners who could have any interrupted uh, experience within their educational system uh, or some limitations. So uh, when we think about even students in their home countries, let's say they go to school every single day, but a teacher doesn't show up most of the time, we would also consider that student's life. Uh, when we talk about reading instruction, uh, and I want to go through this and specifically the foundations of reading, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we're going to kind of work backwards from the reading comprehension as being the goal of 
reading foundations and reading in general and understanding the text and being able to talk about it and analyze it and discuss it. And um, there, it happens to be nowadays that there are researchers, advocates who now actually think that we should make it into six pillars, that that fifth pillar reading comprehension should get pushed to the sixth one. And we should now add background knowledge because we know how important background knowledge is to reading comprehension. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting point and discussion that's happening now in the in the reading community. Uh, vocabulary being a, a component of language, right? Words that the child understands. Obviously, we know how important that is to reading comprehension. Fluency, which is part of skilled reading, uh, the accurate reading with the expression and a rate that supports comprehension. So when our students struggle with their both the fluency and the accuracy, it can then be a struggle to comprehend what we're reading. Uh, phonics, which is a type of instruction, the sound to symbol correspondence, and then our phonemic awareness, which is a type of knowledge, the smallest sound in spoken words. Many of us, I would say most of us, right, are doing at least some of these within our ELA classrooms, our ELA content classrooms, um, anyway, to support our multilingual students. Uh, the question for us is, are we hitting on all of them? And if we're not, is there a way that we can do that in our ELA content classrooms so that we are supportive of our SLIFE? Um, some of you maybe have seen this before. This is Scarborough's Rope, um, and it relates to the simple view of reading, which was presented in 1986, which says that decoding the D, uh, that's the blue strand, uh, multiplied by language comprehension, which is the red strand, that gives us skilled reading. And that these two, each of the strands for each of the ropes, the blue rope and the, and the red rope, when those are woven together and we have all of those and we support all of those, that's when we get our skilled reading. And we know that our SLIFE come here with so many skills and so many strengths. Uh, and we really wanna utilize those in the classroom. We also at the same time want to recognize the areas that are a challenge for them so that we make sure to support those areas as well. Um, so when we look at, for example, Scarborough's Rope, we often wanna to think to ourselves, well, okay, which areas within both language comprehension and word recognition in those two areas, uh, which areas does my student maybe struggle in? And how can I integrate that into my curriculum in order to best support them? When we talk about the needs of secondary SLIFE, um, we wanna look at when it comes to foundational literacy in general, um, how we do that and why it's so important. Um, Marguerite Lukes talks about this in her book on uh, Latino students with interrupted schooling. And she says that nationally, 40 students who enter college who need remedial courses or, or a developmental course, that um, those students statistically are at a higher risk of leaving or not completing their degree. So we really want to think about, well, how might this impact my SLIFE, right? How might this impact the students if they're graduating high school and they're going to be possibly in those courses, how, what will, what is my role in possibly helping them so that that may not be the case in order that we can help them to um, either complete their degree more efficiently or um, support them so that they aren't part of this statistic. When it comes to, again, the needs of secondary SLIFE, we see that uh, much of the research does show, and we know this even from our own experience, that we do wanna focus on developing reading skills and how critical it is, again, in addition to all the other things that we're doing. And as I mentioned before, as secondary teachers, this is complex and, and it's complicated because we are teaching content um, at so much of the time, right? And we, Sometimes, I mean, this year is a different ball game, but right, state tests when we think about getting our students ready for those types of um, exams as well, that just as secondary teachers, we have a different even uh, load that we're thinking of and extra challenge for our SLIFE. Um, again, also Andrea DiCaprio and Helene Marshall also point out the need for the basic building blocks of literacy. So we really see this again and again in this life literature. Um, you know, we also, Carol Salva talks about this, Freeman and Freeman talks about this, that, you know, we need grade and age level appropriate content. And we also need the building blocks of literacy. And then obviously the question is, well, how do we do that? Um, LESLA, which is um, an organization that uh, recently published this book, they work with adult 
uh, Slife, adult learners. And they recently published a book that uh, has so much of their research in it. And they also talked about the need for the foundational literacy skills uh, for adult learners and how much it helped them improve. Uh, before we go through how we start, how we pick a text and then what we do with the text, um, I also want to point out that obviously our students, right, they're not little children when we talk about the secondary classroom. So we're not necessarily, we're not really talking about teaching the foundational skills in the same way that we would teach a young child, right? So it is going to look different because it's a secondary classroom, because they are secondary learners, and because in general, their brains are more developed and therefore how they are able to acquire the language, how they're able to acquire those skills looks very different than a young child. And we should also remember that as well in our planning. All right, so how do we choose a text? Um, these are questions that uh, we as an ELA team um, in one of the schools that I worked in developed together to decide whether the text was appropriate for our life. So the first one is, is the text appropriate for all learners in my classroom? And when I say appropriate, that could be culture, that could be uh, background knowledge, that could appropriate could mean a lot of different things. Um, and so I, you know, we like to use the term appropriate because if at any point it seems like this text does not make sense for my students, could be for a number of reasons, native language, um, the culture, um, again, background knowledge, any of those things, then it's got to go, right? It's not, we're not, then if the answer is no to that question, then it's going, we're not using it. Uh, we obviously want to be using text that is appropriate. Uh, what background knowledge can I build from this text, right? So we as teachers know how important it is to build background knowledge for our students. And if we can't build that background knowledge and that, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be through lived experiences. It could be building background knowledge that you are directly teaching explicitly uh, that you have them doing through reading, through writing, through activities. If for some reason it, you as a teacher think Think, you know what, I'm not really going to be able to build background knowledge on this, or I'm not going to be able to build enough background knowledge on this that I think it's going to be supportive enough for my students, then text has got to go. Um, I do want to point out uh, before I continue that some schools and some districts have mandated texts. That is another layer that is complicated and complex. And I do believe that any one of our texts can be adapted and there are ways to use it in order to support our life. But if you as a teacher get to choose the text within your classrooms, then this is kind of a guide of questions that you want to use. Um, how can I incorporate native language support? So that can look uh, different. It could be audio. It could be visual. Um, and I don't mean just translations when it comes to na native language support. How will I adapt this text? The reality is for our life, they do need some version of an adapted text. That doesn't mean you have to change the whole text, uh, but whether that's through chunking, um, whether that's through making it look different visually, whether that's through taking some of it out and only keeping in other pieces of it. But it's important to recognize that just kind of throwing a typical text at our students when they are struggling possibly with uh, literacy and particularly with foundational literacy, that that is going to be a huge challenge for them. And often times when we do that with our SLIFE students, you often will see a shutdown because we're not meeting their needs the way that we need to. Um, how will I incorporate, and then kind of any of the foundational skills, right, in this text, right? How will I incorporate my phonemic awareness, my phonics, my vocabulary, my fluency? What activities am I going to do? Um, and how am I going to make sure that it supports my students? And then also, and I'm going to talk about this after we talk about the reading piece, um, is how I will I incorporate the writing foundations in a systematic way. And I'm going to talk about that um, after we go through how we adapt a text and how we integrate the foundations into a text. But we know how much the reading and the writing really support each other. And we want our students to write no matter what, whether that's a check mark or you know just circling something, we want them to be involved in our classes in order to support them. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually do this practically. We're gonna go through this step-by-step. Step. Uh, the, the, the documents you're gonna see in front of you, the um, curriculum, part of the curriculum that you're gonna see in front of you uh, is what I developed when I was teaching um, in a newcomer, a school for newcomers, uh, particularly older adolescent newcomers. And um, in that school, many, many of our students were slave. They came to us at the ages generally between 15 and 19. And many came with us to us either um, uh, 
uh, very low literacy in their native languages, which was very typical. But then we also had students who were completely proficient in their native languages and everyone was in the same classroom. Um, in that school, we did not teach ESL classes. They were, every class was a language content class, uh, just to give you a sense of um, where these documents kind of came from. So we went through those questions that I just showed you and decided that Romeo and Juliet would be and um, is appropriate for all our learners. There are ways that we can help our students connect to this text and uh, we can definitely adapt it. Native language can definitely be involved. There are so many versions of Romeo and Juliet um, or Shakespeare in general in so many different languages. Uh, there are audio versions, there are movie versions. So we decided that this was a great way for us to be able to involve our students in uh, grade and age level content and also support them with again the re reading and writing foundation. So if you look on your right, you'll see that that's the Romeo and Juliet prologue. Again, it's not the um, it's not the original English. It's one of the adapted texts uh, English. And you can see that for some of the students, they were going through summarizing and answering questions specifically on that was their going to be their task for that uh, prologue. When you look on your right, you see that was the version that students um, that some of our SLIFE received in order to support them, right? So we don't ever want our SLIFE sitting in our class being like, I don't know what's going on, or I can't get involved because maybe the text, I can't engage with the text, maybe it feels like it's too overwhelming. We don't ever want them to have that experience in our classrooms. So. The first thing we want to do when we look at a text is, you know, we want to pick out those pieces that we want our slave to know in order to be able to engage with the rest of the classroom, right? So we want to, we want them to know where this is taking place. So as you can see, then on the right side, um, it's in Verona, Italy. And again, that helps me build background knowledge and talk about culture and, and for them to be able to, again, uh, um, comprehend and uh, relate to the text. We want to know what the text is talking about, right? So if you look on the right, you have several lines. If you look on the left, we're talking about their families fighting, right? Um, and again, I'm using visuals in order to support them. We then want to know who we're talking about. So we're talking about Romeo and Juliet. And then we also want to know any other crucial details within a text. So we would do this also um, a few of the things that we did with our students before they saw the Romeo and Juliet prologue is we took several New York Times articles on love, on marriage, and we did this exact same thing. Uh, we went through it and we said, what are the crucial details? Who is it talking about? What is it talking about? And we made um, a new version. We adapted it in the same way so that our slife could um, uh, could be involved in the classroom in, and that they were fully supported within their literacy development. When we talk about reading, so that's how we choose text and adapt it. When we talk about integrating actual reading foundations, I'm going to first show you phonics. I'm, many of us work on um, the reading foundations such as fluency and vocabulary pretty regularly. Um, I often find that with um, secondary teachers, it's the phonics and the phonemic awareness that we often struggle with integrating. So I'm going to talk about the phonics for a minute, and we're going to talk about phonemic, and then we're going to talk about phonemic awareness and then what that looks like. So after we've adapted a text, then I'm going to ask myself, okay, which phonics uh, lessons do I need my student to do, to be aware of, in order to um, access this text fully? Um, and again, you may not do this, right, on day one. It might be day one, for example, let's say you start on a Monday. Let's say on Monday, you're going to read the whole text together as a class, and then on Tuesday, you're going to do this, right? So it's not saying that you have to do this every single lesson, uh, but this is an example of ways that we can do this within our class. So, um, one way we do this, right, is we look at the, the phonics instruction here. So no word in the English language, for example, ends with the letter V, a silent E is added. It doesn't change the vowel sound, which is a CBC vowel sound. So for example, live, have, give. So what I would do is I would show them this. We would teach it explicitly in the first five minutes of class. And then we'd have um, a like phonics bulletin board or phonics kind of poster, anchor poster uh, chart uh, that would they'd be able to refer back to throughout the rest of the year, honestly. Um, the second one, right, then I looked at the text and I said, okay, we're reading their family's fight. So let's talk about how there is really a non-phonetic word and let's teach all of those one, two, three. This is another example of when I say that, right, our students are older adolescents, right? They're not, they're not young children. So it might be that for a young child, you may not teach all of those at the same time. But for my 17 year olds, 
even if they are struggling with reading foundations, I can teach all of those at the same time. Uh, again, a lot of that has to do with knowing your students, knowing what they can handle, uh, knowing what will be supportive of them. The next one is that adding the suffix s right to words that end in y, uh, preceded by consonant change, right? So many of us do this automatically. Um, families, pennies, babies, right? And again, those are examples that you would be able to put on a chart. What we found when we were doing this is that when we were teaching these uh, lessons explicitly, it wasn't only helpful to our SIFE, but it was also helpful to all of our multilingual students. Um, and for the students who already knew this and they could kind of breeze through it, they just you know, listen for the five minutes and we did it together. And sometimes they had interesting linguistic questions that I never wasn't even able to answer that I was like, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I actually don't know. Um, and it was interesting because it brought out really interesting questions and a lot of curiosity about English as a language, um, in addition to then also talking about and listening to the, um, the content. Um, all right, so we are going to now look at what phonemic awareness uh, a dictation lesson would look like. It's again, lesson in a lesson. So this would happen sometimes at the beginning of class or sometimes the end of class. Um, if it made sense within um, a certain unit, we would also uh, do it, let's say in a small group, whole group situation. But what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this student, uh, I'm gonna dictate, you're gonna hear me talking and then you're gonna hear the, and watch this student uh, write down what I'm saying. He runs to the fun. He, 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 he runs. Up on kiss. He, he, he. What does that say? <laughs> start over, start over, start over. He runs. Start here, start here. He, well, runs mm. to the fun. Okay, so what you saw there is you saw a student who actually had been in the country for a year before uh, I started teaching him actually, and um, he was really, really struggling, really struggling in all of his content classes. And that is actually what really sparked um, my speaking to our principal and saying, you know, this may be a crazy idea, but I wonder if we try and integrate some of the more foundational reading skills and writing skills into our classes, if that might be supportive um, of these students. And so we did a lot of researching and thinking about how we were going to do that. And one of the things we came up with, with was this dictation. And we would, as you can see, say either words or a sentence and they they would write it out. So you could even see in that video, after I say he runs, you see him write a lowercase h and then erases and says uppercase, right? So it's he was able to do that, something he wasn't able to do after having been in the country for a year um, and still really struggling to be able to do that after being taught how to do that explicitly through, again, we're talking five minutes, right? In the morning, in the beginning of a lesson or again, end of lesson, middle of lesson, however you decide to do it. Um, that really supported him to be able to do this. And this also, again, uh, points to the phonemic awareness of students having to really listen to the smallest sounds of words in order to be able to write down uh, the sentence or the words that we are uh, dictating to them. We also found that this was, I mean, we found that this was very supportive of our life and very supportive of actually all our multilingual students. Um, that this particular exercise was because it um, allowed for really quick feedback. We would kind of go around and give them feedback immediately. And again, it was ways for them to ask kind of even like quick questions, right? If one of them had a quick question, for example, you know, he, you see him say uh, lowercase or uppercase, right? But if a student had a question about that, you know, I'm going to have them dictate three sentences. It's going to be really quick and they can ask questions. And um, it allowed for that, I would say, like kind of intense, quick five minute support that um, allowed them to really fly throughout the rest of the year. Orly, can I jump yeah. in here for a second? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I just saw we have a, a an attendee who um, has a burning question. So sure. I wanted to jump in with that. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is around supporting English literacy, uh, presumably in this way that, that you're showing yeah. and versus um, 
supporting literacy in the native language first. And my guess is ah, once once okay. you get to this once you get to the secondary level, yeah, uh, you may have students with so many different native languages in your class that the the option is to provide English supports, but I wanted to give you a second to address that. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, the reason I haven't mentioned native language support is because this is specific to the ELA content classroom and the class in which that, and this is specific to ELA, to English development, we know as language teachers that native language development it is supportive of English development, right? If we can do both, and there is a lot of discussion about, for example, a slave student, do I start with native language? For example, uh, we had students who came to us at the age of 18 and were not reading in their native languages. And we had long talks and discussion, debate, <laughs> um, argument over whether we just go right into the English um, or if we only do native language, if we even can do native language, depending on what the native language is, um, or if we do them simultaneously. Um, it is really complex. Uh, my answer would be that if you as a school or you as a teacher can do native language literacy support, then yes, you definitely should be doing that. And for the students that we could do that with, that is that is what we did. Um, so for example, we had uh, a Spanish native language specialist on staff and she would work with our Spanish speakers uh, who needed it, our slave Spanish speakers who needed the foundational literacy in Spanish. Uh, while those of us who are teaching English would also uh, work on that same thing in English. We actually did it simultaneously as opposed to one before the other. Uh, but the class that I taught, the classes in which that I taught and that you see here um, were mixed native languages. We had anywhere from 35 different languages in the classroom um, at you know, one time. So that's why for, for me as the English teacher, mo most of what I was doing was teaching the English foundations. I utilize native language within the writing. So sometimes that would involve translations or audio or whatever it is. Um, I hope that, I think that answers the question. <laughs> um, but I would yes. do, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. And yeah. um, that question was from uh, Evelyn. So Evelyn, if you have any follow-up, she says, yes, thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, okay. thanks Orly. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so what, what does that look like in my lesson? So we're going to talk about that um, in terms of how we can practically do this. And then I'm going to show you kind of what almost like a sample lesson plan could look like. So when we think about phonics, fluency, phonemic awareness, vocabulary, vocab, I think, is the number one thing that we all do really anyway. Oh, it's like you know, second nature to us when you're teaching multilingual students. Um, and the, the phonics phonemic awareness piece and sometimes the fluency, though I find that that also tends to be second nature to many of us, um, even secondary teacher, teachers as well. But again, if you wanna teach, phon if you wanna integrate phonics instruction, so how are ways you can do that? You can do that before, during, or towards the end of a lesson, right? Again, I really mean like five minutes. If you want to spend longer, if you can spend longer, right, um, then great. But it doesn't need to be, you know, a 45-minute phonics lesson. Um, it's those quick, really high-impact lessons and skills that's going to allow our life to access whatever text we're giving them. And then in addition to that, it not only helps them access that text, but then future texts as well. And again, the idea of building that kind of like phonics, either word wall or anchor charts or however you do it in order to support them. You could do it on sp specific days. Uh, we kind of, we started to do something that we called found, uh, Foundation Fridays. Um, and we would spend time doing it on that specific day. You could do it on a specific month, right? Just There are so many creative ways that you can integrate this type of uh, instruction into your classroom. Uh, fluency, choral reading, individual work with it, small group. Um, Again, there are a lot of different ways that you can uh, involve that or include it into your lessons. Phonemic awareness, again, like you just saw the uh, dictation exercise, again, beginning or end of lesson, we often did it at the beginning. Um, again, you can do it on specific days. So um, at one point, the school that I was in, we at Wednesdays were like called like language days. And we actually focused more specifically on things like foundational literacy skills. Um, we ended up changing that. But that's another example, you could do it on a specific day that you let's say decide you want to do half the lesson. Um, or um, again, the you can do it through games, which is really exciting. Uh, vocabulary, explicit teaching, again, this is something I I think is second nature to, to uh, secondary teachers, but before, during, or end of lesson, and obviously a uh, word wall in order to support our students. So what does a lesson plan look like? Many of us, 
not all of us, right, are very aware of our content objectives and our language objectives. Uh, we really started adding, again, not every lesson. We did not do, I want to make this very clear, we did not do this for every single lesson. Um, but we did thoughtfully put in reading and writing objectives um, as it made sense within our curriculum. So we really sat down as an ELA team to think about and look at what we were teaching and how we were going to do that and how we were going to give our SLIFE maximum support when it came to foundational reading and writing and how that looked uh, specifically integrated into our curriculum and what made sense, right? So this relates back to um, Romeo and Juliet and specifically the prologue. So let's say in the content objective, they're going to determine the purpose of the prologue. The language objective, they're going to both read the pro prologue and then they're going to list the advantages and disadvantages of including it in Romeo and Juliet. And for my reading and writing objective that day, I'm going to apply the suffix S rule. Again, this is a phonics um, and phonemic awareness example. Um, but again, it could be for any of the foundational literacy skills. Um, and then they're going to write dictation on it. So again, this is a, obviously a very shortened version of a lesson plan, but you're gonna have, we're gonna have our warm up, which we talked about whether books are better than movies. Then we're gonna do our quick suffix, suffix S rule. We're gonna dictate, read, or I'm gonna say, they're gonna write three sentences and then we're gonna read in pairs and we're gonna list those advantages and disadvantages. And what we found as we were doing this is that our SLIFE were able to do every part of the lesson in various forms, um, but that they were also much more confident when they were given uh, ways to access the text uh, full on from the beginning, um, that there was a sense of confidence, a sense of uh, support that allowed them to um, um, involve themselves in the lesson, involve themselves in their school day in a way that we found um, happened, I would say, even much faster than when we weren't doing this because it really gave them the ability to fully integrate themselves in what we were doing within the content classes. I want to now um, talk about writing foundations and, and how they relate to reading foundations and, and how to support um, our students. So when, when we think about writing foundations for our SLIFE, uh, many of our SLIFE come to us and they uh, some struggle, some are, you know, are not, but um, some I've had students come and were kind of like, what do I even do with this pencil, right? What do I do with this pencil? Um, so asking them to write, you know, just a paragraph off the bat would not be appropriate. Um, and we want to support them so that each part of uh, the writing instruction is building on each other. Uh, we really were thinking about our writing curriculum with, within our reading as building blocks. We're going to start here and we're going to build up um, and we're going to support them. And if we kind of have a crack in that foundation somewhere, uh, we may it may mean that our students are going to struggle once we get to, for example, that paragraph, that essay. Um, and how do we want from the very beginning for them to um, be able to access this curriculum? So what you see on the on the very left, the you see it says like cats, hats, maps, caps. That's an example of, di of dictation. Um, for uh, our students when we were doing um, um, the reading foundations and they were writing it out. Um, that's an example of a SLIFE student. What you see in the middle, okay, when you just saw from the from the lesson plan, when it says the list, the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so it is possible and it actually has happened, right? That when we would do this, we had students who were not ready to list the advantages and disadvantages. So some of them were only ready, for example, to do a check mark. So what did we do? We said, great, if you see an advantage, do a check mark. Great, I want you to write a check mark. That is writing, that is engaging, that is allowing our students, our SLIFE, to be involved in what we're doing and to give an opinion, to be a part of the process, right? Same thing you see then on the right. I may have SLIFE who are ready for the, the, the version all the way on the right. Or I may have SLIFE who say, I am, I all I'm, I'm just gonna circle um, here. That's what I'm going to do. Again, this that circling or giving a check is not something that we should be concerned concerned about. That is amazing, something we should celebrate. We should celebrate their involvement in our classroom. And, and this is what we mean by the, the writing foundation. So we're going to take that. We're going to take that. I see that my student, my SLIFE is saying, let's say we have all these advantages or we have these disadvantages, um, or I agree with this or I disagree with that. And now I'm going to build on it in order to support them within my classroom. Um, now I'm going to take that information and I'm going to think, okay, how can I support them for the next skill, for the next development uh, that we're going to do as a class? 
So you can see here, again, this is kind of, it's jumping a little bit, the, you know, there's curriculum you're not seeing that that got to this point, but this is an example of like, then how we would kind of get to the next point, right? So we're going to start off kind of with, me. again, some students, you have to know your students, some may be ready to write you whole paragraphs, right, in their native languages, please use native language, don't ever have a child sit in your classroom and do nothing, and that's kind of my other point of let them do check marks and circles or whatever it is. No child should ever sit in any of our classes and not do anything. We can always find ways to support our students to involve themselves and engage themselves in our classrooms. Um, so when you see here on the on the left, you see we were talking about indirect characterization and character traits. Uh, that was one of the things that students were going to be writing about, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, and then again, you can see on the right that we were having students look at evidence um, and also giving them kind of the sentence starter of I chose this evidence because but again, some students, maybe they weren't ready for that maybe they're only going to circle the best evidence and they're not ready to write yet. That's fine right maybe they're again just going to give me a check mark. We want them to engage with us in any way that that means that we can build on on that engagement. Um, and then we build up again to the next piece. So again, you, you, you see here on the left, uh, passionate was uh, one of the character traits we were talking about. And then we were talking about helping students form claims, evidence, and then analysis. On the right, you see a student um, who was life uh, be able to then eventually after at the end of the Romeo and Juliet unit, be able to write um, an essay using all of those skills. Um, and you see here, like we, for most of our life, we started with just a claim. Uh, then we talked about claim and evidence. Then we talked about adding the analysis. We did this in whole group. We did it individually. So we're talking about a lot of practice. We're talking about seeing it over and over and over again, um, the way you we do any skills, right? When we think about, let's say, learning how to play an instrument, we practice over and over. So it's the same idea, but we build up to that. Uh, we don't just give it to them off the bat, um, but we allow them to engage in other ways so that we aren't making the curriculum um, something that is lower than what they can handle cognitively because they are thinkers and they want to be involved and they have really strong opinions. Teenagers have really strong opinions, right, on a lot of things. And we want them to show that to us in the classroom. We want them to write about it. We want them to be involved. And we need to give them those building blocks, that foundational support in order for them to fully engage in our classes. This is an example of a bulletin board um, from of the kind of writing foundations and building on themselves, particularly in Romeo and Juliet. You can kind of see we brainstormed uh, the character traits. We found evidence. So again, those are examples of ways that we adapted the text. Different students were, as you saw earlier, given different versions. Um, they then wrote claims, evidence, and analysis, again, in a scaffolded way, in a supportive way. And then and the, the one that we put on the bulletin board was um, a paragraph. And some of those students that you, you can't see the exact writing, but you can see pictures of the paragraphs uh, were slave students. And that when we support them with the foundational skills, along with the uh, content and age appropriate, a grade age appropriate uh, material, that um, they really just can fly and they, they can do anything. And it's really amazing to watch. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of end with this idea um, and talk about uh, linking um, and the idea of a chain and the idea of when our when we put all of the links together um, that we're we are stronger both as as educators and uh, we see our students that way and we want to be able to see our students um, and their strengths. We at the same time also want to acknowledge their challenges so that we fully support them. But I think what's really important is that each pieces of these links, their previous experiences, the reading foundations, the writing foundations, the speaking and listening, the culturally responsive pedagogy, each parts, um, you know, that we want our child to experience or that the child, the student is is experiencing or has experienced is part of who that whole child is. And we never want to try and replace one of those things, right? We don't want to take out, for example, their previous experiences or their native language and replace it with whatever experiences we think they should or what we want to give them or take out their native language and only put in right English, for example. We want to use all of those things together in order to support them fully in our classrooms. We want them to know that we see them fully. Um, 
and the idea of community, right? That we as a school community, a classroom community, uh, that we come together in order to support them and that all of those things come together in order to support our life. Um, and that when it breaks, then that's when we don't get the full picture of our students. Um, and I, you know, I think about this a lot because we often as teachers, there's so much that we have to consider for our students. And there's so much on our students' plate and there's so much on our plate. And when we talk about our life and, and the assets that they bring and the strengths that that they bring to our classrooms and how we absolutely need to utilize that and we need to focus on that. We also don't want to break off that reading and writing foundations piece because it's those reading and writing foundations piece that also helps support them as learners. So we don't want to break it off. We just want to make sure that we are fully supporting all of the linking of all of those aspects um, of our life students in order to fully support them in our classrooms. Um, yeah, so I guess I ended a little early. <laughs> I think I talked faster than I thought I was going to. <laughs> no, I think you are right on time. Right. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, okay, can you, I just want to make sure I mean, that everybody can see me because I it looks like yeah. I have my camera turned on, but I can't see myself. So okay, let me, oh wait, there I am. Okay, okay. just making yeah. sure. Okay, good. No, that was perfect. We do have some questions. So Great. we will we will get to those. And um, well, first I wanna make sure everybody knows what's coming up next week because that is always important. Next week we have Michelle Izquierdo coming back and she's doing a presentation on um, project-based learning. Get real with project-based learning. I love the title. Yeah. Uh, and this is um, this sort of came about um, as a result of the last webinar she did with us and some attendee questions that, that came up. So she's generous enough to come back and um, talk to us about project-based learning. So that will be next week. Go ahead and register on our website or through the email that uh, you will receive prompting you to, um, to register. So let's get to some questions. Now, there are a couple that were in the chat as well as some that are uh, in the Q&A area. And then there was one that also came in um, from, pre um, from a registrant uh, before our session today. So uh, which one shall I tackle first? Um, <laughs> a lot, lot of thank yous and um, appreciation for your, yeah. um, for your information today. Uh, there was one that came in. It was in the chat. I'm trying to find it. Oh, it was Jacqueline. Jacqueline wanted to know about um, seeing this. It says curriculum, um, but we can maybe take your your lesson as an example. Yeah. Um, and presenting it uh, online. What I mean. What are some elements that are workable online. Like I'm thinking about the um, sure. the the, 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 the dictation activities, potentially something you could do, you yeah. know, on a, on a jam board or something like that collaboratively. Yeah. So any other yeah. thoughts like that? Yeah, for sure. And that's a great question because obviously at the times we're living in, you know, this was done in a physical classroom and not online, but um, a lot of it, if not all of it, you can really put onto, for example, Google Slides. A lot of it we did actually use on Google Slides on our smart boards back in the day. Um, that, so a lot of it you really can do, especially there's so much amazing technology that you can have students, for example, record themselves that you can listen to. You can record yourself. Uh, the dictation for sure you can have students do, um, whether that is typing all at the same time or writing down. Um, the Again, the phonics piece also, um, you could definitely put that onto, onto Jamboard uh, easily and have them follow along that way. And have like, I know um, I've seen some teachers have kind of like uh, online word walls. You can have like online phonics word walls if you wanted to integrate it that way as well. Awesome. Thank you. And we had another question that um, came in uh, and I attempted to answer it, Emily. I hope that you found that link helpful. Uh, but Emily is in a situation, her teachers are asking about teaching phonemic awareness once they go back in person to a, into a hybrid situation with masks on. That make That's an added challenge for sure. Yes. Uh, and the first thing I thought of was like sound videos. Um, so um, I, I actually sent Emily a link to some ideas that uh, some teachers were talking about online. Is there anything that jumps into your mind? Yeah, um, it is definitely a major challenge, like but not just for our secondary and multilingual learners, for our very little ones also, this has been a hot topic because it is complicated um, with the masks, obviously. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with you, Liz. I think there are a bunch of videos. Um, I don't know what link you shared, but um, even on YouTube, there are, um, oh, there's someone that's escaping my, my um, 
I forget her name right now, but she has been doing videos to specifically show um, uh, how to, uh, you know, pronounce words and, and enunciation. Uh, so I would say using those. There are also, um, there are uh, word, uh, like picture cards uh, that show how the mouth is supposed to look when you are uh, pronouncing certain uh, uh, sounds. Uh, so that's another thing you could have kind of like that kind of, I've seen bulletin boards of like sound, uh, Sound walls is what they call them. Um, so you can put up those as well, which I think would be very helpful. We have some suggestions coming in through the chat as well. There's an app from Orton Gillingham that focuses on the mouth. Um, Spalding phonograms, YouTube videos. Uh, YouTube, Rachel English is very good with pronunciation. Um, taking pictures, Anne says she takes pictures of her mouth to create the sound and she does posters and, and slides. So awesome. Thank you all so much. This is what I love about our webinars. Everybody yeah, is just great. so, yes. <laughs> that's great. Awesome. Um, there were a few more, the questions just keep coming in. So hang in there guys. I'm going to try to get to everybody. Um, so the Sue, where's my friend, Susan Hurt? You had a question, Sue, you have put a question in the chat and I can't find it now. Um, Oh, Barbara wants a follow-up session. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, oh, Susan wants to know, um, she says, your instructional materials are fantastic. Did you create them all yourself? Yes, I did. She did. <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and then how much of, um, there was another question here, how much of the book did you do this with? Because I mean, you, I know you said you didn't do it for every single lesson, but for the uh, Romeo and Juliet, yeah. um, ex exactly how much of the, throughout the entire book, did you did you take these steps and create the visuals and, and, and sure. follow all those steps? Yeah, so um, anytime students were reading text, we did this, which was quite a lot. Um, we, um, I mean, I created, uh, I re I would say I rewrote the text in order for for students to access it that way. Um, so, but not every lesson came with like a phonics lesson necessarily because it didn't necessarily need it. So, for example, by the time we got to the second act, right, I didn't need to go over all the same. Uh, phonics instruction that I had already done, there may have been more that we specifically wanted to go over. Um, I mean, I chose not to teach every single. Uh, part of Romeo and Juliet, for example, because it didn't make sense for my purposes. Um, but I would say most of it, <laughs> um, I rewrote most of it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this, the question was from Louisa. She said she really loved your visual, visual representations of the prologue. How much of the, of the text did you adapt in this way? Which is what you just, yeah. um, yeah. what you just answered. So thank you. Um, we have, um, Justin wants to know any suggestions for developing speaking skills for students who might not be so confident in their abilities or just shy in general with a new uh, for, well, new online format in his case. Yeah, so online obviously is really more complicated, but I think kind of the nice thing about online, which I definitely have seen many other teachers doing is that there are ways that you can engage students uh, that maybe wouldn't necessarily wanna engage in that way in a classroom, but are more comfortable because they might be able to put their camera off for example, um, or they can record themselves and send you a recording, right? We actually had students sometimes do that even before remote uh, that we wanted them to practice reading at home and they would record themselves and send it, uh, you know, on they would upload it and send it. Um, so I would say, I, I think Flipgrid also, I think they just recently allowed students to record themselves without, um, without video, I think, but I could be wrong on that. So if anyone else, if someone wants to correct me on that, <laughs> um, but um, so I would say engage, like, you know, first I would say there needs to be a healthy balance between pushing and allowing a student, right? Who doesn't feel like they, if, whose personality is not to do it that way or doesn't feel comfortable yet to engage in that way that we need to have kind of like a healthy dose of both. Um, sometimes that means just finding the right instruction. Sometimes it means the right topic. Um, so I don't, does that answer the question? I'm not sure if that. Totally. It does. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. And uh, uh, people are responding in the chat as well about Flipgrid and uh, you can try, you can turn the camera off in Flipgrid. Uh, you can cut and paste an emoji to cover your face. And so there are other things that you can, you can do to kind of help out with, with that. So, okay. Uh, Vanessa wants to know what percentage should we be focusing on teaching phonemic awareness? This is for high school SIFE. Sure. Yeah, um, it's a great question also. I, I mean, these are all great questions. Um, I would say we focused, 
Hmm, I was going to say we focused more on phonics. We we probably did focus more on phonics. We did more phonics instruction than we did phonemic awareness. Um, it's hard. I, it's hard to answer that question because both skills are really important. If you're, if you, for example, said to me, listen, like, I really don't have the time to do both. It's really, let's say, going to be like phonics rules or it's going to be phonemic awareness. Then I'd probably say phonics rules because um, those are probably a little bit more kind of like hard hitter rules versus uh, practicing the actual sounds. Um, Actually, I take that back. You know what? I that is a really hard question to answer. Um, I, I think I think both are really, really important for different reasons. I think that integrating them together obviously is ideal, and that um, um, yeah, actually, I stand by what I said. But we definitely did more phonics than we did phonemic awareness. Yeah, because um, we spent more time ensuring that those rules were down, and also that we can create kind of anchor charts, and there were other ways to support it uh, within the curriculum itself. It is really challenging as secondary teachers. I, 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 I really relate to this challenge. I mean, I was there, you know, like I, I like, I want to hug everyone and be like, this is really hard, <laughs> um, yeah. you know? So um, yeah, I think uh, if you're going to choose, let's say like you only have time for one or, or you feel more comfortable with one or whatever it is, then that's what I, that's what I would say. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, Vanessa says more phonics and phonemic awareness. Got it. I have been struggling with the same questions. Thank yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sarah has a great question and uh, Jude chimed in that he's in the, he or she is in the same boat. Um, she said, how many teachers feel like they could teach a class of secondary English learners, including SLIFE using these strategies? Uh, but what if you're in a place where you have such a small number of newcomers that they're in the mainstream classes yeah. um, with the majority of non-EL, non-Ls? Yeah. So if that's the situation, um, that's tough because creating all these visuals and structuring a lesson in that way when the majority of your class is uh, grade level uh, native English speaker yeah. It's um, it's a it's a challenge. So uh, any any tips um, or thoughts on that? Sure, um, that is extremely challenging. I mean, I I think that's probably the most challenging, honestly, because um, it's just it's just a whole different ball game. Uh, you know, when you're when you're talking about that type of um, uh, classroom structure. Um, so my suggestion would be is, first of all, obviously, I think sometimes when we either watch webinars with a lot of information, it can almost like feel like overwhelming, like, you know, which is, and it's like, but how do I do all of that? And, you know, um, so my suggestion is like, well, how, how are we gonna make sure that that kid can at least at the very surface level, but before we even think about like the foundational skills and giving that to them, like how are they going to access even like the grade level text that you're giving, right? So it, like, and again, I know I mentioned that some states, some districts, some schools mandate certain text, but you know, that's where we go back to like, is this text really appropriate for all of my learners in the classroom? Whether that means because I'm finding an adaptation or because I'm gonna create the adaptation, um, I would say that's kind of, that really is the first step of, yeah, those visuals are really important. They're, they're vital really for these kids, particularly in that environment. And even though the reading foundations are also obviously so important, um, I would say like, that's like your step, your step one is making sure they can like just access that text to be able to see what's going on and, and to be able to understand it that way and then take it from there. Um, we have some people chiming in that um, even though we have um, students with all levels, the things we do for our English learners and SLIFE are beneficial for everyone. Um, so uh, uh, theoretically, I mean, talking in theories and hypotheticals is very different from uh, what happens in practice. But if you provided all of your students with the with something like Orly created with the visuals on it, I mean, it certainly wouldn't hurt your uh, your native speakers uh, to, to get something like that. And somebody else actually said, um, this is a question. Um, do you recommend letting life students watch the movie before reading the book? So is is that a good um, is that a good idea? Is that is that a support? So um, lots of things to chew on here. There's no everybody's situation is slightly different. So there's no one umbrella recommendation we can give everybody. Uh, but we do the best we can to kind of provide answers for you. So I'm going to let you speak to the movie piece as well as the what works for. Uh, English learners were, you know, can work or help with all and, and then we'll answer the last couple of questions and we'll sign off.
Sure. Um, so we, I'll just tell you what we did and, and what worked for us. And again, really reiterating what Liz said, like every classroom structure is different and students have different needs. So as a teacher, I think the question is like, you know, you have to ask yourself like, well, why would I show the movie first? Um, I, and I think that starting from there and, and being able to answer those questions will help you kind of answer it for yourself. We did not show the movie first. Uh, we really worked on visuals and, um, and the text itself. I'm going to be taking a deep dive really into the text and what the language is saying using, obviously, as you saw, heavy visuals. And then we showed uh, parts of the video. We did not watch the whole thing, but we showed parts of it um, really very intentionally uh, to give them an kind of a bet, an even better understanding of what was going on. But that's what worked for us. Uh, we did that really purposefully, but I have seen classes where they show it first in order to kind of front load the images um, through a movie visual, which is also really helpful. So I think it really just depends on what makes sense for you in your classroom and what really your purpose is for either showing the video first or let's say integrated or after. Thank you. Uh, and again, more suggestions keep coming in through the, the chat as well. Um, before we sign off, I wanted to get to this question that somebody um, submitted when they registered. Uh, I'm not sure if this person is on with us today or not, but I thought it was a really good question. So this person um, talks about what happens in the elementary grades. She says, in the elementary grades, most districts give students a literacy screener of some sort. English alphabet identification, letter sounds, sight words lists, but phonemic awareness, running records, that type of thing. So for secondary SIF students, would you suggest waiting a few weeks before giving these assessments to give the student time to acquire some basic English uh, BICs? Um, what, and what would the timeline recommendation be? So when we're talking about those, those screeners, yeah. um, is it beneficial to do it like right off the bat or should we let the students get settled a little bit and and maybe absorb some some basic uh, language before we before we do that. I thought it was a, a good question, so yeah. I wanted to. Um, and then if this person, um, I didn't write down your name. I'm sorry. Um, that's that's terribly rude on my part. I'm sorry. So if you are watching the recording or you're on live with us and you. Um, asked this question. I apologize. I, I'm not attributing it because I didn't write down your name. I'm sorry. Uh, but Orly, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, there are definitely different approaches and different opinions on this. Again, this is what worked for us. Uh, we actually did it right off the bat. Uh, we did a really, um, you know, kind of like low stakes, right? Like very like, hey, we're gonna go through this together. And like, if you're not sure about something, it doesn't really matter. You know, like, you know, very low stakes um kind of assessment because we did find that we did have some slave who who came in with english knowledge right who came in with some phonics knowledge and with you know so um you know and that looked very different for example for a student who like didn't come in let's say with any any of that knowledge and we also assess native language literacy that's a huge piece again i'm not really i'm not gonna touch that piece but that is a huge piece here um the reason we did it is because we really wanted to uh be able to look at growth from the get-go. Um, and we felt that even if a student couldn't do any of the assessments that we did, like that was just good information. Um, to me, um, assessing, again, I don't mean like all of your students like sitting there standardized tests like for you know days on end, but again, the kind of low stakes stuff, right? Uh, whether that's the ABCs or can you reading a few words or um, having them write kind of a screener, particularly for SLIFE really gives us a good sense of where their literacy is. Um, again, should be in their native language, but also if they have in English as well. Um, and you as a teacher also, like if it looks like it is either uncomfortable for your student or doesn't make sense for that one particular student or whatever it is can always say, don't worry about it. like we're not doing it anymore or never mind. you know what I mean? So I that's kind of my opinion is the more information we have, um, the better it helps us to serve our students. Um, but, at the same time, we also need to know our students. So if it feels like when that student comes in, like it, you already get a sense, um, I kind of like I call it like the teacher spidey sense that it's not going to make sense to assess that, assess that student. If you feel like there is going to be, a, a, if it's a, going to be really difficult for that child for whatever reason, then I would say, hold off. Yeah. Is there a specific tool, Regina wants to know, is there a specific progress monitoring tool, a literacy-based one to track? I think there's probably a lot of them out there. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, like I personally can't, you know, recommend one, but I think what Virginia is seeking is some sort of idea of like names of tools, perhaps. Do you know any off sure. the top I mean, of your head? 
um, I will tell you that there are definitely some free ones that you can definitely, like if you Google, there are plenty. <laughs> um, and um, so we, um, what did we use? We actually, um, we used something that I had already had uh, that wasn't online, but there are, on, if like, if you Google search um, like free literacy screener, free reading screener, for example, you will probably find one. And you're welcome to also reach out to me uh, if you have any specific questions about that. Yes, uh, the one last question. Um, do you have more curriculum or lesson plans you can share? And I thought you might wanna let people know where they can find you to reach out for more information about what you, this is what you do. Um, yes. <laughs> so how, how can people find you? Sure, okay, so um, I do have things that are already created and there are things that I am happy to share. People can uh, email me. I mean, you can also obviously find me on Twitter, but. Um, if you want to email me and ask me questions or things, if you would like to uh, me to share some things with you, um, I also kind of as Liz, men Liz mentioned, this is something I do. So if you wanted to reach out and said like, "Hey, we're about to teach this in my school," or "I'm thinking ahead about this is what we want to teach," like I'm happy to either help you with that or bounce ideas off, uh, you know, with you. Um, so you can definitely send me an email or a message on Twitter, or wherever, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Okay. Now it's uh, Orly at Multilinguals Forward, right? I'll put it in the chat, mm -hmm. Orly. Uh, dot org, just letting you know. Okay. Yeah. There it goes for everybody to be able to reach you. Thank you so much, everybody. This is great conversation, great questions today, great content, of course. Thank you, Orly. And we had several requests for uh, a follow up. So um, we'll we'll definitely be in touch again because this is these are tools that people uh, need, and and we always try to respond to uh, audience. Um, oh, you're welcome, Ren Rena. Rena, I do my best. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, um, thank you to everybody. Um, you know how to find Saddleback. If you are on social media, whichever your preferred platform, we are there too. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, never miss a webinar again. Uh, you can find us uh, on YouTube is my favorite. So um, mm -hmm. that's, that's where you find me hanging out all, in all of our previous webinars. Uh, and of course, we always end with a big thank Thank you for all you do. Your job in normal times is not easy. And now it's just unbelievably complicated. So uh, we do our part. We try to do our part in offering you information to help you uh, and, and of course help your students. So uh, just a big thank you for all the hard work you put in every day. And thank you again to, to Orly. And we will see everybody next week with our uh, for our webinar with Michelle. Take care. <laughs>